Good day and welcome to the Kojiko Incorporated and Kojiko Communications Incorporated Quarter 1 2022 Earnings Conference Call. Today's conference is being recorded. At this time, I would like to turn the conference over to Mr. Patrice Wiemet, Senior Vice President and Chief Financial Officer of Kojiko Incorporated and Kojiko Communications Incorporated. Please go ahead, Mr. Wiemet. Thank you. So good morning, everybody, and welcome to this quarterly conference call, which uh, Philippe Jeté and I will present. So again, as we begin this call, I'd like to remind listeners that the call is subject to forward-looking statements, which can be found in our press releases issued yesterday. I'll turn the call over now to Philippe Jeté. Merci, Patrice. Good morning, and thank you all for joining us to discuss the financial results of Kojiko Communications and Kojiko Inc., Let me first note that we are satisfied with Kojiko Communications' overall performance for the first quarter of fiscal 2022, which is in line with our expectations in our Canadian operations and slightly ahead in our U.S. operations. On the radio side, Kojiko Media continues to face pressure from a slow advertising market in light of a COVID-19 pandemic and current supply chain disruptions impacting many industries. However, all in all, these results position us very well to start on our fiscal 2022 on a solid footing. Let's start with our U.S. operations recent initiatives. We closed the Ohio acquisition on September 1st, which added nearly 690,000 serviceable households and businesses to our footprint. The integration of these assets is advancing well and according to plan. This acquisition represents a strong strategic fit for Kojiko Communications, as it is complementary to our existing U.S. footprint and capitalize on our existing American platform. On January 10th, our U.S. subsidiary announced a full rebrand, changing its operating name from Atlantic Broadband to BreezeLine. With the recent acquisition of Ohio and other expansion initiatives, the rebrand aims to better represent its geographic reach, which is now beyond the eastern seaboard, the breadth of its product line, and a pledge to an excellent customer experience. As part of the rebrand initiative, BreezeLine launched BreezeLine Stream TV, a cloud-based IPTV service allowing customers to access live and recorded programs through a a single, very easy to use interface on every device inside and outside the home, in addition to several popular streaming application. BreezeLine will gradually roll out this new offering across its footprint during the year. We expect the new offering to contribute to free cash flow as it is more capital efficient and allows for customer self-installations. BreezeLine is moving along with its plan to invest approximately 82 million dollars U.S. in network expansions in fiscal 2022 to reach nearly 70,000 additional homes and businesses with fiber to the home services. Franchise agreements have been obtained in multiple communities in New Hampshire and West Virginia, and many other franchise agreements should be concluded in other states in the current fiscal year. It is an exciting period as we are planning to have our first commercial launch within a few weeks. And at Kojiko Connection, we are also progressing well with our network expansion projects, where we are planning to increase the number of homes pass by 3% by fiscal year end. The 13 high-speed internet network expansion projects which were awarded in several regions of Quebec, are expected to be completed by September 2022. 
In addition, we are active in several projects in Ontario, with more to come as a major broadband funding program is being launched in the province to connect additional unserved and underserved regions. On the customer experience side, our data analytics capabilities and introduction of new marketing automation leveraging artificial intelligence are resulting in lower churn and improving video and telephony customer trends. We are also continuing to gain traction with our cornerstone high-speed internet services and with Epico, our IPTV entertainment service. Finally, we continue to prepare for an entry in the wireless market and are currently participating in a CRTC proceeding that will establish the terms and conditions for access to the incumbent wireless networks. As for Kojiko Media, even though the radio business continues to face pressure of the current economy on the uh, advertising market, we continue to enjoy strong ratings from our listeners based on the fall 2021 Numeris survey results, which confirm the outstanding performance of all Kojiko Media radio stations. In particular, our 98.5 station, which was the most listened to station in all of Canada. I will let Patrice now discuss our financial results. Thank you, Philip. So revenue at Kojiko Communications is up 19% and adjusted EBITDA up 14.9% in constant currency when compared to the same quarter last year. This was essentially driven by EBITDA growth of 33% at BreezeLine, formerly Atlantic Broadband, mainly as a result of the Ohio Systems acquisition. Free cash flow declined by 5.2% in constant currency, mainly as a result of increased capital expenditures acquisition and integration costs related to the Ohio acquisition and financial expenses, partly offset by higher EBITDA and lower current income taxes. Capital intensity reached 19.6% compared to 18.8% last year, mainly due to the higher capital expenditures of our U.S. operations related to the Ohio systems network infrastructure and to support footprint expansion combined with accelerated e equipment purchases. In the first quarter, Kojiko Communication continued to be active in its share buyback program with the purchase of 274,000 shares for a total consideration of $29.5 million. As our first quarter was slight, slightly above expectations, we are confirming our Kojiko Communication Fiscal 2022 financial guidelines, which were updated in November to include the Ohio acquisition. On a constant currency basis, we still expect that Kojiko Communication will grow its revenue in the range of 15 to 17% and EBITDA in the range of 14 to 16%. We believe that the Ohio acquisition should still contribute approximately 11.5% of revenue growth and 11% of EBITDA growth. As for organic revenue and EBITDA growth, we expect, the, we expect the U.S. operations to generate mid-single digit growth uh, and the Canadian operations to generate low single, low single digit growth. Excluding the network expansion projects, we expect free cash flow and constant currency to grow between 5 and 15%. As for quarterly results, we expect that organic year-over-year -year EBITDA growth will gradually improve throughout the fiscal year for both BreezeLine and Kojiko Connection, as we had an unusually strong first two quarters last year, given that certain expenses, such as marketing and advertising, had been deferred to the second half of the year. We expect that capital expenditures will gradually increase throughout the year as network expansions and the Ohio integration capital expenditures will ramp up. Now let's look at the individual components. In the US, BreezeLine's revenue and EBITDA in constant currency increased by 31 and 33% respectively for the first quarter. 
mainly as a result of the Ohio broadband acquisition. Now, if we exclude the Ohio impact, revenue and cost and currency increased by 4.6%, mainly as a result of annual rate increases implemented for certain services and a higher internet service customer base and, and a higher value product mix. Partly offset by lower advertising revenue as last year was an election year in the United States. EBITDA excluding the Ohio impact in constant currency increased by 4.3%, mainly as a result of organic revenue growth, partly offset by rebranding costs to Breezeline and higher marketing and advertising activity. We expect a similar organic EBITDA growth trend in the second quarter as we continue to invest in the rebranding, which will then be followed by stronger growth in the second half of the fiscal year. As we had highlighted when we announced the Ohio acquisition, we expect that revenue generated from the Ohio transaction will gradually decline in fiscal 22, mostly as a result of a declining video customer base while we integrate the operations and transition to an IPTV platform. But we do expect the EBITDA to remain stable. During the first quarter of fiscal 22, the internet subscriber base remain essentially stable, generally due to low customer movements in the industry following significant customer additions last year, as some customers have accelerated switching to our high-speed internet services. Other factors include more seasonal disconnects uh, this year, which were unusually low last year in the context of the pandemic. More non-pay disconnects due to the lapsing of some COVID relief programs in the U.S., less bulk unit connections uh, this quarter, and competitive offers in a portion of the footprint. We do expect that internet customer growth will resume throughout the remainder of the fiscal year. The larger loss in video customers is mainly due to a stable internet customer base. The broadband first strategy that we have uh, been using for a year, which is focused on a higher uh, product mix, and losses in the Ohio system which were planned. Finally, we expect that quarterly video customer losses will reduce in the future quarters. Turning to the Canadian operations, Cogeco Connections revenue increased by 8.2% in constant currency relative to the same quarter last year. Excluding the impact of the Derry Telecom acquisition, revenue and constant currency defined by 0.6%, mainly due to annual rate increases, which were delayed to November fiscal 2021 in some geographies, and a decline in video and telephony customers, partly offset by the positive impact of a higher internet customer base. Physical connections EBITDA increased by 0.7% in constant currency relative to last year. Excluding the impact of the Delhi Telecom acquisition, EBITDA and constant currency declined by 6.9%, which was as expected as part of our annual guidance. The decline is mainly due to higher marketing and advertising expenses to support overall customer base growth, compared to unusually low cost in the same quarter last year in the context of the pandemic. We expect slightly higher positive EBITDA growth in the second quarter compared to the first quarter uh, as our Canadian operations should, re should resume their organic growth, and the Derry Telecom results were included for most of last year's second quarter. We then expect that Cogeco Connection will generate mid-single-digit EBITDA growth in the second half of the year. The broadband customer additions in the first quarter were slightly lower compared to last year, which benefited from the positive impact of the pandemic. The video and phone Customer losses were better than last year, resulting from a more targeted marketing and advertising approach by region and by market. Now let us look at Kojiko Inc. In the first quarter, consolidated revenue increased by 18% and EBITDA increased by 12.9% in constant currency. Revenue related to the radio operations decreased by 2.6%, mainly due to a soft advertising uh, market in the context of the pandemic and the slow economic recovery for media companies. We are confirming Kojiko Inc.'s fiscal 22 financial guidelines, which were updated in November and reflect the same expectations as for Kojiko Communications. 
Kojiko Inc. also announced yesterday the launch of a normal course issuer bid to acquire up to 325,000 subordinate voting shares over the next year. Kojiko believes that the purchase of its subordinate voting shares is an attractive use of its liquidity. I'll turn the call over now for, to Philip for concluding remarks. Thank you, Patrice. As you can see, we have started fiscal 2022 on a solid ground, and we expect that organic year-over-year -year EBITDA growth will gradually improve throughout the year, the fiscal year, as we add an unusually strong first half in fiscal 2021. The ongoing trend of customers spending more time at home for work, education, or entertainment should continue to have a positive impact on our growth outlook. Finally, I would like to give an update on Kojiko's commitment relating to environmental, social, and corporate governance. On December 7th, Kojiko published its first Climate Action Plan and Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosures, outlining the key steps it is taking in support of an urgent climate action, as well as its processes and strategies to assess and manage climate-related risk and opportunities. Our plan includes actions to reduce our own operational emissions, covering 100% of our Scope 1 and Scope 2 emissions, as well as the most material emissions from our value chain, representing over 67% of our Scope 3 emissions. It also includes actions to ensure long-term resilience by identifying and mitigating our key climate-related risk while maximizing climate-related opportunities. A few weeks after receiving His Royal Highness the Prince of Wales Terra Carta Seal in recognition of our commitment to creating a sustainable future, Kojiko received on December 7th the prestigious A rating from CDP. This rating demonstrates Kojiko's leadership and commitment to best practices in governance, disclosure, and emissions reduction. We are proud of this achievement. Only three Canadian companies achieved this score, and none of our peers in Canada and the U.S. made the A-list. Lastly, Kojiko and Kojiko Communications announced on December 17 that they both transition their term revolving bank facilities into the first syndicated sustainability link loans in Canada within the telecommunications and media sector. The facilities incorporate ESG linked incentive pricing terms, which reduce or increase the cost of funding depending on the annual performance against specific targets. These targets are related to Kojiko's greenhouse gas annual emissions reduction and our digital inclusion initiative to provide 75,000 homes in underserved and unserved areas of Canada with access to high-speed internet service over a three-year period. Additionally, Kojiko and Kojiko Communications will dedicate any savings achieved from the sustainability linked loans towards internal sustainability initiatives. And now we will be happy to answer your questions. At this time, we would like to inform everyone if you would like to ask a question, press star then one on your telephone keypad. Once again, star one to come into the question queue. Our first question is going to come from the line of Aravinda Gulapapaj with Canaccord Genuity. Good morning. Uh, thanks for taking my questions and uh, Happy New Year. Um, uh, just a couple of questions for me. Um, first of all, I was wondering if you can sort of uh, uh, sort of uh, flesh out the um, the internet uh, movements in in the U.S. I know that historically. Seasonality has hasn't always been consistent, and obviously the pandemic may have disturbed that as well. I was wondering if you can talk to that variance 
And uh, perhaps connected to that, I mean, we know that uh, there's been a bit of a sell-off in the U.S. cable codes, and uh, there is a little bit more awareness around, uh, you know, the U.S. telcos starting to step up their uh, network expansions uh, and, in particular, sort of upgrades. I wanted to get your thoughts on that and whether you're seeing any of that uh, in within your footprint. Well, let me just start with um, uh, one or even two uh, step back. Before the pandemic, um, the industry had a run rate. The pandemic certainly changed um, many customer behaviors, and there was different needs that the industry um, uh, took care of by connecting even more customers very fast. And now it seems that uh, we're coming back two trends that were um, that are in line with pre-pandemic levels. Now I'll turn to uh, to Patrice to answer the, uh, the second component of your question. Uh, yeah. So uh, in terms of the uh, build-outs of uh, phone companies with uh, fiber to the home, uh, we we have seen some announcements as well. But I would say we have seen uh, little impact uh, so far. Um, so we'll have to see in the future, but I would say uh, at this point we're not really uh, seeing uh, uh, much action in terms of converting uh, DSL into uh, fiber to the home. And just coming back to the question on uh, internet, yes, yeah, so we were, we did uh, run uh, with uh, fairly high internet subs uh, over the last two fiscal years. Uh, there is uh, less activity right now, and uh, we believe that a portion of customers have made the switch as people were spending more time at home, switch from uh, competitors to our high-speed internet products and, and the other products we offer. Uh, we do expect that the attractiveness is there and we'll, we'll continue to add uh, subscribers, and we do expect future quarters to be more active than what we saw in Q1. Uh, but there is a bit of a pause from there. Uh, other items relate to, uh, you were mentioning seasonality. Uh, last year, we had less uh, disconnections uh, due to seasonality than usual. And we uh, believe it's also due to the pandemic. Um, people were moving less than before, spending more time at home as well. Uh, whereas this year, we're a bit more back to normal. Um, we also had this quarter less bulk additions in the Florida market. Uh, this varies by quarter, but it was a softer quarter. Uh, we expect the next, uh, at least the next two quarters, to be more active in Florida. And um, um, and the last uh, piece would be the non-pay disconnect. So, uh, given the programs, the COVID uh, relief programs that were in place in uh, many states and at the federal level. Um, we uh, many of these programs have lapsed now, and we've seen a uh, higher non-pay churn, which is more uh, usual. And uh, last year was unusually uh, low. Okay, thank you uh, for those. Uh, thank you for that color. Um, and then uh, maybe for Patrice, uh, uh, switching over to CapEx. Um, obviously, you provided very specific uh, guidance on 22. Um, uh, how should we think about uh, network? expansion options going into 23 and beyond, um, you know, is, should, are we likely to see perhaps more, uh, uh, more, uh, you know, initiatives on the U.S. front as you sort of exploit the sort of the new legislation there, or, um, you know, is that sort of uncertain at this point? Yeah, so uh, this year we're planning to spend between 200 and 240 uh, sorry, 230 and 240 million dollars, and that's Canadian dollars uh, total in network expansion. And at the high level, it's approximately half and half between Canada and the U.S. Um, Canada right now is very focused on the build in Quebec, uh, which has to be done by September 22. Uh, so there will be little in the uh, in Quebec in the next uh, fiscal year. Um, we do have an, uh, smaller projects in Ontario that are ongoing and that will carry over uh, in the next year. But there is also um, a new program coming up in a few months. It's going to be an auction, actually, in Ontario. Uh, we're going to be participating, but it's difficult to say exactly uh, uh, how big it will be until we go through the, the process. Uh, so that's Canada. And the, in the U.S., 
Um, we are planning to add about 70,000 homes past this year. The, the, the timing can sometimes uh, change by a quarter, uh, but that's the plan for now. Um, we like this business. Uh, it's, it's something that we've been doing in Florida for uh, a long time, and we're targeting mid-teen unlivered returns on this expansion. Uh, so, uh, as Philip said, we're uh, going to have our first network, uh, a very small one that's going to be live uh, very soon from these expansions. And then throughout the year, uh, especially in the last few quarters of the year, we will have the bulk of it. Um, so I, I do expect that we will do, be doing more in fiscal 23. Uh, the pace of it will depend on how attractive we uh, see the different opportunities uh, for growth. Um, and I would not say it's a permanent situation, but I would I would expect the U.S. will remain active in uh, fiscal 23. And maybe one last point on this is that um, this year is more of a build uh, period. In fiscal 23, we do expect to see the benefit of uh, additions of uh, PSUs and uh, obviously some revenues and, and EBITDA, but I would say the bulk of the EBITDA contribution will come the next year. But you, you should start seeing meaningful additions of uh, subs in fiscal 23. Okay, thank you very much. I'll pass the line. Thank you. Our next question will come from the line of Jerome Dubriel with Desjardins. Merci. Bonjour tout le monde. Uh, thanks everyone. Um, on wireless in the U.S., uh, in the past you appear to be a bit more focused on M&A and had no intention to partner in an MVMO, MVNO model. Um, I wonder if you can comment on if your thinking has evolved in terms of uh, stepping into wireless uh, in the U.S. recently. Well, uh, <laughs> It's uh, bonjour, Jérôme. It's all prioritized with the size of opportunities, uh, our capacity to execute um, on the short and the midterm time frame, as well as the return uh, we're expecting to get. So right now, at this point, still in the U.S., we see we see very strong opportunities to edge out to expand our networks um, with very high quality fiber to the home networks. Um, increase our shares in adjacent uh, market share and adjacent footprint. Uh, that is still at the very top of organic or edging out uh, growth right now. Uh, we are interested in Canada on the wireless side. We all know that. We are aware of what to do in the U.S., but it's all a question of prioritization. Um, and right now, the network um, expansion, the wireline network expansion in the U.S. are top of our list. And we uh, need to know as well uh, in the short future what the Biden infrastructure program will look like. There's another 40-some billion uh, dollar in subsidy that will cascade down uh, to the states. Uh, that program is not very well known at the moment in details, but uh, we will continue to monitor that. Okay, thank that's helpful. And um, also with the uh, with the Omicron wave we're, we're seeing right now, uh, obviously this has not impacted uh, the quarter you just reported, uh, but wondering if so far you are seeing uh, maybe similar impacts to, to last year on the January one or maybe more muted impact. Well, on the telecommunications side, uh, our operations, uh, our 724 operations, are very robust against uh, the pandemic right now. We have very good process. Uh, we uh, we can cope with the different uh, the different uh, regulations that are coming uh, from the different states uh, very well. On the media side, uh, it's actually more the markets that is being impacted right now. We have uh, several segments of the market that has not resumed an economic recovery, uh, so they uh, they don't really advertise at the moment. And others have uh, supply chain disruption or labor disruption. Some, some segments have, have actually um, quite strong demand, but since they can supply to that demand uh, with uh, shortage in products or labor, uh, they uh, they are slow on advertising. That's helpful. Merci. 
Our next question will come from the line of Vince Valentini with TD Securities. Thanks very much. First, Patrice, can I try to clarify a couple of the, of the U.S. broadband um, things you talked about? In your prepared remarks, I, I think you said for the rest of the year you expect positive Internet ads, but you said it pretty fast. I just want to make sure that's what you said. Uh, that's right. Perfect. The um, churn and, and the non-pay churn you talked about, if, if you just look at overall churn of your broadband subs in the U.S., can you tell us if that was stable year over year or did it increase? Uh, I would say we're closer to uh, usual trends, uh, whereas uh, last year was unusually low. Um, obviously, as, uh, as there were a lot of uh, restrictions on people moving and people were highly working from home and also getting education at home, um, we had less uh, interest from customers to uh, make uh, switches, especially leaving us. Uh, we had people interested in moving to high-speed internet on our network, but less people uh, uh, leaving us, or actually uh, moving houses as well. So that was a bit uh, slower last year. So I would say we're more back to normal at this point. So if I look back to two years ago in the first quarter of 2020, your churn would be pretty similar this quarter? Uh, yes, at the, at the high level, yes. Okay. It's the uh, it's the acquisition that's a bit uh, slower than usual for the reasons I mentioned. Uh, a, a slight, probably a slight pause or a bit less demand. That a lot of people have already moved to our networks in the, in the past two years, but it's this uh, this will pick up as well. And last on this topic, you, you, the seasonal disconnect. Can you just fill me in on that? I assume this isn't Florida, because in Florida people would be going there in in the winter months, not leaving there. Is there some region where you have a lot of seasonal uh, households? Uh, we, we do have households uh, along the coast, so it's not just in Florida. Actually, Florida, uh, we have a sizable uh, bulk um, uh, business, so what, whatever is in the bulk contract does not move. It's a yearly contract, but we do have uh, add-ons, so some of the contracts will provide just video, for example and people will take retail internet, so these can uh, be disconnected potentially. Uh, but no, we, do, we also have uh, people in other states uh, uh, higher up uh, that will have vacation homes uh, in the summer. Uh, so it's a bit uh, the inverse of, uh, of Florida. Oh, okay. And um, two other quick other topics, if you don't mind. Bree Breezeline rebranding. Can you give us any sense of uh, how big that is um, for the full year? And I'm surprised that you say it impacted Q1 much because you just announced it this week and Q1 ended in November. So you were actually already spending money that got expensed in in Q1? Uh, we did, yeah. So there were uh, – obviously, this requires a lot of preparation. Uh, and uh, to be able to make uh, an effective launch, you need to have everything ready. So we did, uh, we did invest uh, uh, some amounts in Q1, and there will be some in Q2 and Q3 as well. Um, I wouldn't say it's, uh, it's the only thing. There's obviously ge more general sales and marketing, but that's part of the reason for, uh, for being a bit lower than usual. But we do expect the second half of the year to be higher than usual in terms of EBITDA growth in the uh, higher end of the single digit. So the full amount, Patrice, over the three quarters, is it, like, is it $5 million or more, or is it a more immaterial amount? Uh, it, it's probably in that range. It's uh, yeah. It, it definitely uh, you need to change logos. You need to uh, rebrand the the uh, the equipment we use as well, like the trucks. And so there there are some costs to do that and some marketing as well. But it's uh, yeah. It's it, it's it's a few million, but it's it's not. I wouldn't say it's just a uh, half a million dollars. <laughs> and the last question, um, maybe more for Philippe, but whoever wants to answer it, you, you talk about priorities for investment uh, in relation to that <clears throat> U.S. wireless question. Uh, I'm wondering about radio. Um, the CRTC is probably coming out with a review of regulations soon, and I think most people expect and think there should be more allowance for consolidation and in Canada and allowing people to own more stations in a market. If that happens, it, it, can radio be on your list of priorities for investment to, to bulk up and take advantage of scale and synergies? 
Well, thanks, Vince. Uh, it's too soon to, uh, to to answer that question. We will obviously participate. We've been in constant uh, dialogue with uh, our governments, both um, at the federal level as well as the provincial level. Uh, there is a lot of attention, as you know, on media, whether it's uh, papers or radio or television. Uh, they've suffered a lot through the pandemic. So we will continue to participate um, through the different forums that are active at this moment, uh, and we'll see where, what the future uh, will look like for, uh, for the media sector. Thank you. Our next question will come from the line of Jeff Fan with Scotiabank. Hi, thank you, and good morning. Um, just a quick follow-up on the um, – U.S. broadband net additions, um, you said it's going to be positive for the rest of the year. Can you elaborate on um, what drives that for the rest of the year, what initiatives you have in place? Maybe you talked about it, but I'm sorry if I missed it. Um, the other question related to the broadband is in your release, you talked about or you made mention of competitive offers in portions of your footprint um, that resulted in the net additions results. Uh, for U.S. broadband. Can you elaborate a little bit on that? Um, because in your earlier answer, you talked about no evidence of any impact from fiber. Are you seeing impact from fixed wireless? Because um, I guess a couple of bigger players are making a lot of noise um, in the U.S. on that one. Thanks. Well, m maybe, Je uh, Jeff, um, if I could start with uh, the uh, latter part of your question uh, to address the fixed wireless. Uh, we've noticed, too, there's a uh, number of things that are being said. Uh, now, this capacity is coming from capacity that was um, being built and assigned to a mobile initiative. So as you very well know, the ARPU per gig on the mo on mobile network is much, much, much higher than fixed wireless, where uh, fixed wireless uh, consumers consume 40 times the amount of data uh, than on the mobile side. So we will remain skeptical to see major um, shift from network capacity from mobile to fixed wireless. Fix wireless. We will monitor, like you will, uh, what's, uh, what's really being done there. Uh, but the high cost of spectrum and the high cost of mobile uh, network builds uh, suggest that uh, fixed wireless is very local, opportunistic, and in small areas. Yeah. So on the um, on the uh, broadband uh, additions uh, in the future, obviously this is something that. Uh, is always difficult to predict with accuracy, and that's why we don't provide specific guidance on it. Uh, and also, these uh, these additions or, or losses in a specific quarter are a small portion of the overall base. That being said, uh, we do have a number of programs, including the the launch of the Breeze Line program. So there's a number of marketing activities going on there. Uh, I talked about the lasting of certain government uh, aid that was provided that created some churn. Um, this should normally not be there for the for a good portion of the balance of uh, of the year, as uh, as the bulk of it was uh, was during the quarter. Uh, there's some seasonality patterns as well. Um, as I said, like, this quarter was a bit uh, 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 more normal, but last year was abnormal. Uh, we do expect that the um, uh, so the, the pause we were seeing, given that there we had uh, an accelerated uh, level of addition in the last two years, will not last forever as well. So we do expect that activity on the uh, on the new customer side uh, will start as well. And and lastly, um, as I said, the bulk uh, additions in Florida were low in this quarter. Uh, actually, they were lower than last year. Um, and we're going to have some quarters because we have good visibility on this. We're going to have quarters um, in the balance of the year where you'll see the reverse, where we're going to be higher than last year. Thank you. Um, if I may just follow up on um, Philippe's comment, um, I totally agree about the, the cost per gig. I mean, there, the math um, says itself. Um, but I guess these, these operators um, are using excess um, 5G capacity in their network for fixed wireless. Um, and also, um, I guess the, 
you know, the, the cost per gig might have an impact longer term as to how big that business may turn out becoming for them. But in the, in the shorter term, um, it doesn't stop them from trying to grow their broadband business because that seems to be a big, big focus in printing those big fixed wire to subscriber numbers for the street. Um, are you concerned a bit about even their attempt? No, we're not concerned. As I said, it's going to be localized. It's going to be opportunistic. But the uh, high cost of uh, mobile spectrum uh, is uh, is sunk, uh, and, and it won't go away. So eventually they'll have to bring back that capacity in line with the business model that brings the ARPU at the right level. So uh, I... I, I I, I actually feel for those customers that would be will be sell uh, sold something in the interim period, and after some time they, w- they will have to be taken back to to move that capacity to mobile. So it won't be a great customer experience uh, eventually. Okay, fair enough. Um, one last question, just on wireless in Canada. Um, I know there's still quite a bit of um, uncertainty in terms of how that model might play out, um, you know, just on your HMNO model, can you just remind us, um, do you own the core? Or is the plan for Kojiko that if you do pursue this, to own your own core? And if so, um, have you started to make investments in that area? Uh, and if you do own your own core, does that have an impact on costs and free cash flow going forward if you do decide to move forward? Yeah, so uh, that's a a good question. No, we have not made a major investment in core. We've always uh, uh, said that we need to control the core part of the network. Now, it doesn't mean that we have to buy it. We could lease it. There are different uh, models out there, but uh, it all starts with the terms and conditions that the, the CRTC will uh, will put in the um, wholesale framework. So we are investigating, of course, uh, uh, the, the latest development in technology, um, and CapEx is a different order of magnitude, but we are, we are also looking at models, uh, pretty much CapEx light model, where control doesn't mean, doesn't mean ownership of every pieces. Great, that's helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question comes from Matthew Griffiths with Bank of America, Merrill Lynch. Oh, hi, thanks for uh, taking the question. Um, I just wanted to follow up on the Canadian wireless um, kind of aspirations. Um, you know, I know that the terms and conditions kind of proceeding, if that's the right term, is ongoing, but can you point to any kind of timelines or expectations about um, when you think it might conclude? Yes, it's a long process. The CRTC just launched another um, uh, request for comments uh, with a long list of questions to the industry. Um, So all I can really say is that this uh, investigation will need to close uh, for the next step to be set by the CRTC. The best uh, uh, time frame we have right now is likely very late spring, early summer. Okay, great, thanks. But since, and then, but the, since the CRTC do not publish <laughs> uh, roadmaps or time calendar, uh, we're, we're all waiting on them to, to declare something on timing. It, right, of course. And then um, on the 70,000 uh, homes that you are aiming to add in the U.S., um, I guess, this calendar, this fiscal year. Um, what is the expectation? Well, first of all, can you, can you maybe characterize the area that you're expanding into? Will you be the sole cable operator? Is there, are there existing cable operators in those footprints? And what are the expectations for the pace of adding pen- or achieving uh, target penetration levels? Uh, sure. So the U.S. Uh, expansion is different than Canada. Canada is in areas that are underserved or unserved, and uh, we typically partner with the government to provide it. And generally, um, while well, to be eligible basically in these areas, uh, the competition will be DSL or fixed wireless or, or nothing. 
In the U.S., it's different. We're actually uh, going into areas like we've been doing in Florida for many years. Now we're going, it's more in New Hampshire, so it's, it's more uh, northeast. Uh, and we are going into um, average size uh, cities, average for us at least. Um, and um, uh, typically there is one cable operator and there is also a DSL operator from uh, a phone company. And we bring in fiber to the home. So it's a dif different dynamic. Our penetration rates um, we're expecting in the U.S. are different as well. We're targeting 36% over three years, whereas in Canada it's higher at 50%. Um, and, um, but we are the only one with a fiber product, but there is also a cable uh, operator there, yes. Okay. And, you know, maybe just to, you know, I don't want to beat the fixed wireless thing too much, but, you know, I, I kind of agree with uh, Philip's kind of characterization of lo local opportunistic and in small areas. But I, I think one of the things that um, like we're in focused on is if, if these areas, if these local and opportunistic small areas are, are the areas where you're operating. Because um, I think the conversation, if we look at it nationally, you know, has one flavor. But if we look locally and if you're seeing a, a growing um, challenge from the fixed wireless operators in your local areas, um, that would be, you know, a different conversation. So um, I, you mentioned you're monitoring it, but are you seeing, like, what are you seeing when you're monitoring in, in, in your kind of market intelligence that you're, that you're looking at in your, in your local uh, small areas? No, that's a good question. Um, of course, if you want to sell excess capacity, you need to start having excess capacity. So where have they built a lot of capacity? It's in dense urban centers. Uh, as we are more of a r rural and regional operator, uh, we operate in areas where towers are far from one another. So there's far less capacity to be resold there. Uh, I, would, uh, I would point to... Uh, areas that are dense, urban, and where excess capacity has already been built, which, okay. which, which doesn't map very well with our, our operations. Okay. Okay. Fair enough. So you don't see, I mean, because you, you described basically the T-Mobile model for your area, but uh, you're not seeing it, I guess. Um, that's fair enough. Okay. Thank you for the, for the answer. Our next question will come from Tim Casey with BMO. Uh, thanks. Uh, just a couple for me. Um, with respect to the Canadian wireless opportunities and the potential remedies coming out of um, the Rogers and Shaw transaction, given it's, uh, you know, there's a possibility certainly that, you know, remedies will be negotiated prior to the final terms and conditions on the MBNO side, how should we think about how you're approaching that opportunity? Well, uh, Tim, this is a good question. And again, uh, we're depending on um, the, the, the three bodies that are very closely monitoring this transaction. We've expressed concerns, uh, as you know, to the CRTC for different reasons, to the Competition Bureau and to ISED. Um, now, uh, they are running their analysis and evaluation right now. Uh, it's, uh, it's not known exactly the conclusion uh, that they will draw, each of them, so we still need to give it a little bit more time to see where the the, the three uh, analysis will will point to uh, so we could speculate a lot but right now let's give them the time to to achieve uh, some uh, some analysis and results and uh, we'll see okay related to that you know there is um, you know some speculation in the market certainly from your investors with respect to the block of shares owned by Rogers. I know this is a topic that's been on or been around for a few years, but just in, given the, um, the accelerated CapEx initiatives you have, which are clearly all on strategy, at a high level, what would your appetite be or, or where would 
um, the potential to repurchase shares be within your capital priorities? Yeah, so it's uh, it's definitely part of uh, the capital uh, deployment, and we've been active in uh, with a normal course issuer bid. So, if this situation presented itself, we could uh, play a role, and that's what we've uh, said uh, all along. It's um, although uh, it would be a role because it's a uh, it, it's uh, a sizable investment, but we uh, we do believe that it's uh, buying back our shares is a good investment of uh, capital as long as we can pursue uh, the other things we're doing. And fortunately, we're in a good financial situation and uh, generate a lot of free cash flow. Now, given uh, the various acquisitions we've made in the past uh, year. Our leverage is a bit higher than uh, than our target. Our target long term is three times uh, three turns of EBITDA, uh, but we do have uh, some capacity to play a role if if ever this uh, came along. Thank you. Thank you. And our last question for the day will come from the line of Drew McReynolds with RBC. Yeah, thanks very much, uh, and, and Happy New Year, uh, everyone, uh, and thanks for squeezing me in. Two clarifications. Um, first, uh, Philip, on the wireless <clears throat> framework uh, timing, the late spring, early summer that you just provided, that that's simply to get the terms and conditions finalized by the CRTC, and presumably subsequent to that, you then go into commercial negotiations. Have I got that right? You got it. You got it. It's exactly that. So we need to first uh, see reasonable uh, terms and conditions, and then we will get into negotiation with more or more than one um, incumbents. Okay. Okay. On, perfect. On the rate. Okay. Thank you for that. And uh, Patrice, just a clarification on the Canadian broadband side. When you were talking about Q2 EBITDA being slightly better underlying then uh, Q1, um, you know, I believe Q1 was down 5 or 6%. Um, are, are you turning that into growth in Q2 or just a sequential uh, improvement in that decline? Uh, no, it would be a positive number. So we, um, okay. in the next quarter, uh, when you compare it to last year, Derry Telecom will be there for most of the quarter. We bought it two weeks into the last year's quarter, second quarter. Um, so, yes, we do uh, expect the organic uh, EBITDA uh, to be, um, I would say, um, definitely not uh, uh, the size of negative number we've had in Q1 for the various reasons I, I've explained, and uh, including the daily telecom acquisition, which, again, is only two weeks uh, impact, then it's uh, definitely a positive number in Q2. Okay. Okay, super. Thank you. And uh, last one for me, uh, obviously a lot of uh, competitive um, dynamic discussion in the U.S. Just in, in Canada, uh, can you just give us an update uh, on, you know, any incremental fiber to the home impact? Obviously, Bell's accelerating its fiber to the home extant, uh, expansion through 2021 and, and all through this year as well. Uh, just uh, are you seeing anything out there in the market? Thank you. Yeah, so uh, the the expansion uh, or conversion of uh, of the phone company from either DSL or FTTN to, into fiber has been going on for many years. I wouldn't say that uh, the past year has uh, we've seen a, a big difference. So there's been a, a bit more, but we're competing at about 50% in our footprint uh, with fiber to the home. The rest is a mix of uh, fiber to the node and DSL. Um, we are fairly well equipped. Uh, we offer a gig uh, in terms of top speeds in a large portion of our network, and especially in the areas where we want to do it. Uh, something we could accelerate if we wanted to as well. Um, we have a good uh, IPTV video product as well, uh, Epico, that we launched a year ago, uh, which is a fairly, uh, fairly interesting voice activated. So basically all the bells and whistles in it. Um, so, and then on top of it, we have these network expansions we're doing now. So it's, um, I would say nothing, uh, special this year versus what we've been, uh, seeing in, uh, in past years. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. At this time, I see no further questions in the queue. 
I would like to turn the call over to Mr. Jete and Mr. Wimet for their closing comments. Okay, well, thanks for being there today, and we look forward to talking about our Q2 results in April. And feel free to call us if you have any questions in the meantime. Have a good day. Once again, we'd like to thank you for participating in today's Kojiko conference call. You may now disconnect. <laughs>